Be seated. I love my father very much. My father's the kind of guy, he loved to have a good time. He wanted everybody else to have a good time. My father loved giving gifts to people. That was just something he loved to do. And, and it's really funny. He would travel a lot in his business, and he would go to places like Dubai, China. Dubai has real gold, like lots of real gold. They have real Rolexes. China has not so much. So in one of his many trips, he brought back a gift for me, a Rolex watch. That's right. I had a Rolex watch. It was big. It was gold. It was gaudy. It was hefty. That was until it made my wrist turn green. <laughs> and it couldn't keep time. You know what should have been my first clue? Was that Rolex was not spelled correctly. Didn't get it in Dubai. Now, now, my father, he did it as a joke. He knew it wasn't real. He knew that. Uh, it looked great on my wrist, right? But it wasn't real. From a distance, somebody could say, oh, my gosh, you've got a Rolex. I mean, it said Rolex. Rolex I probably said Rolex. Uh, on the outside. <laughs> but the workings on the inside were nothing. They didn't work right. It said one thing, it showed one thing, but it couldn't even keep good time. Today we're going to unpack something from James, from James' perspective on faith and what is real faith and what is fake faith. What is true faith? What is a false faith? You see, James is dealing with the issue that if our faith is true or is it mere words, do we profess and yet not possess? Do we profess that we have faith, but we do not possess real faith? That is what's interesting about the Bible. It's why James has a hard time with this. Paul had a hard time with it. The word believe, and we saying, right? We believe. Believe in the Bible always had action associated with it. For them, it was unheard of to say, I believe in Jesus and then not follow him. Now, if you would, take your Bible, open to James chapter 2. And as you do that, uh, James 2 is a scripture where you have to understand the whole before you can understand the parts. Believe it or not, this section in James, James 2, 14 through 26, for many years has been considered a very controversial scripture. Throughout history, people have debated that if James was teaching something that went against what Jesus did, was, was James teaching something that went against what Paul was teaching? But if you look at the whole, you find that James, what James teaches and what Paul taught are actually mutually supportive. Here's why. Paul took his start at the point of saving faith. James starts moving it beyond that point into everyday life. Now remember, he's writing to the church. He's writing to the church. These are people who were already saved, who already professed a belief in faith in Jesus Christ. We know that because he keeps calling them brothers. Brothers, brothers, brothers. Now what James is teaching is not at all Unlike what Jesus said in Matthew 7, if you recall. Jesus said in Matthew 7, You will know them by their fruits. You will know them by their fruits. The fact is that throughout the whole of the New Testament, we are taught that our belief must be demonstrated in real life. That our faith must be evident in our behavior and in our actions. I mean, Paul earlier explained that a sinner is justified by faith. That's given a right standing before God. James says now that the saved person is going to prove their salvation by their lives. 
Listen, it's not any different than what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, verses 8, starting in verse 8. You, you probably know some of this by heart. For grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It is a gift of God, as, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. But then watch how he continues that. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand. Now what? So that we would walk in them. That infers that this walk is every day of your life. It manifests itself every day of your life, in your daily walk. People on on the face of this earth in a perverse and corrupt generation have no reason to believe that we are disciples of Jesus Christ if our lives are not changed. I had in the past, I people said to me, well, that's just the way I am. I said, no, that's supposed to be just the way you were. Because if Jesus radically changes you, it changes the old nature. Well, that's just the way I am. That's just how I grew up. Okay, I get that. I get that. But that was before you met Jesus, isn't it? Now that you met Jesus, everything changes. Being a disciple is not a matter of what we say with our lips. It's what we do with our lives after we're saved. Works can save nobody. No one. But equally, no one can be truly saved without producing the work. You should not have to voice that you are a follower of Jesus. Your life should scream it. Can you imagine, people say, you know, uh, how powerful, how powerful word, I mean, action is more than words, but can you, what happens when those two things match up? What happens if your life and your words match up? How much more powerful is that? And James has a really hard time with the church in this. In fact, if you read the text and the way this is written in the Greek, James is, James is ticked. James is not happy. You see, actually in this letter, there's this righteous indignation. And as James understood it, he's saying, you know what, you say you have faith, but I don't see anything. And if that is true, then you have a dead faith or a false faith. Look at James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Now remember, keep in mind when we read this, he's ticked off. He's very irritated. He says, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing or in a need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For just as the body without a spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. It's easy to spot false faith. False faith is belief without benevolence. That's what he says. Somebody comes to you and says, they're hungry, they need water, they need shelter. I'll pray for you. 
False faith is, is belief without benevolence. See, James uses a concrete situation so that everybody will understand. And it illustrates that true faith is proven in our willingness to offer concrete help. And our refusal to offer concrete help is evident of a false faith. How often do we see someone in need and yet have done nothing? I have shared this story with you before, but it bears repeating in this. My mother was a believer. She lived in Hollywood, Florida. Anybody know where Hollywood, Florida is? Okay, good. Uh, Me and Bob. Um, She and my sister were walking through this big park in Hollywood, Florida. And I know, I'm pretty sure I've shared this with you before. And, and she was walking through, and this very small, scraggly, homeless woman came up to my mother and asked her for money. My mother reached into her purse. She gave her a $20 bill. My sister was furious. She said, Mama, don't you know all she's going to do is buy booze and cigarettes? And my mother looked at my sister. She said, Honey, if I was in her position, I'd want booze and cigarettes. She said, baby, that's not my responsibility. I'm not responsible for what she buys with it. She had a need. My mother demonstrated her faith by her action. And I get it. Sometimes sometimes you're going to reach out to somebody. Sometimes you're going to offer help. And you're going to get burned. You're going to get taken advantage of. But you're just going to have to take that chance. So if our faith does not move us into concrete action, if our belief does not move us into benevolence, then it's false. It's fake. False faith is also profession without practice. Y'all remember what the double dog dare is? You, you guys, especially my brothers, you know, you do not turn down a double dog dare. Right? You just don't do it. Right, gentlemen? When you were a kid and something was going to be a really challenge and nobody else wanted to do it, right? You would, be, you would double dog dare somebody. It's a challenge you can't turn down. That's what verse 18 is. That's exactly what he's doing. He's like, I double dog dare you. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. He says, you can say all day long, that you have faith. But if you're not putting it into practice, then it's impossible to prove. How do you prove faith without words? Can you see faith? Can you touch it? Can you smell it? So how do you know it's there? By what it produces. James said, look, you know what? He said, I can take my faith and show you my faith by my life. The challenge here is much like we've heard over years. You've heard in your life, put your money where your mouth is. James is saying, put your practice where your profession is. Because if you continually, if we continually profess that we believe and that we have faith and as a follower of Jesus and we don't put it into practice, then we have a fake faith. It's like this. What if I told you that I have a really nice, expensive cowboy hat, which I do, and I told you I have really nice cowboy boots, which I do, but then I went on to tell you that I have a saddle and a horse blanket and a bridle. If I could use all the words for all the tack that is used on I don't even know what that means, by the way. If I were to use the word tack for all that equipment you put on horses, if I could name all these different spe- uh, uh, types of horses, if I could tell you who won the Kentucky Derby for the last 50 years, if I constantly talked about everything horse, and you asked me one day, said, hey, let's go riding, and I looked at you and said, oh, no, I don't get on horses. I've never been on a horse in my life. What would you think of me? Right, that I was either A, a liar at best, a hypocrite at worst. But I wouldn't be a cowboy, would I? If our faith 
is just intellect without interaction. It's false. James does it again. You know when you're talking to someone, or whether they're talking to you, and they're telling you everything except what you want to know? It's like James is, James is like, look, I hear you got faith. That's great. Show me. What's your point? I had a boss that used to do that to us all the time. He said, you believe, but what's your point? He I had a boss once. You could go to him, and you would go into great detail to explain something, explain all the dynamics of the, of the electronics and the whole nine yards, and he would look at you at the end of it and go, what's your point? And that's what James is doing to the church. He says, okay, you say you believe. I hear the story. That's wonderful. What's your point? Let me see it. What's interesting in this text, he says, you know the difference between you and demons? He says, you say you believe, they say they believe. The difference is at least they're scared to death. At least they shudder. Their, their belief in God and in Jesus causes them to shudder. You can say you believe, but if your intellectual faith does not bring you to a point of interacting with your faith, it's just talk. Faith, fake faith is like this. How many of you take medications on a regular basis? Yeah, I take more and more as every year goes by. Let's say you take a, a, a prescription. And the doctor gives you a prescription. You go fill that prescription. He says, if you take this prescription, it will fix your problem. He's like, okay, I believe that. And you read the instructions, and it says, you take this. It will cure all your problem. Like, I, you know what? I bet they're right. Matter of fact, I believe they're right. I have all the confidence in the world in this medicine. I know who wrote the directions. I saw the prescription. I took the instructions from my doctor. I believe everything about it. I believe this is going to relieve my problem if I just take it. And then you take it and put it on a shelf and never, and never put it in your mouth. What have you just told me? I don't believe this medicine is going to work. You can say you believe in that medicine. You can say you believe all about that medicine. But if you won't take it, is dead. That's false faith. See, it's the same truth that Paul explained when he wrote to Titus. In Titus 1.16, it says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Read that again. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Basically, you can try and tell me all you want, but let me see what you are. Now, he does contrast what is fake and what is real, what is true. True faith results in follow-through. That's where our walk matches our talk. When we walk, we take one step after the other. And if you, so you're walking right, left. Right, left, that, that's walking. Can we agree on that? Okay, good, you're awake. So if I do this, and tell you, I'm walking. Am I walking? I'm not. It's one step after the other. And here's the beauty when he says this is follow through, and this is this. When you take a step of faith, it's action. You know what happens? You grow and you take the next step and the next step and the next step. First faith and then works and then the faith grows and then these actions continually until the point where you are walking this every day of your life. Every day. I, I look around the room. I know some of our uh, guys here, some, of, um, some women too, were in the military. And you know, it's something about, and, and no offense to Navy and Air Force, but in Marines and Army, right, you can spot a Marine from a mile away, even if they've been out of the Marine Corps for 30 years. You ever notice that? 
just by the way they carry themselves, the way they behave. Like, that's an old Marine. Shouldn't it be that way in our walk as we follow through in our faith to go, wow, that's a believer right there. Because of the follow through. If you're following through on your faith, it's real. True faith is also to be alive. Not you, but your faith is alive. It's useful. Faith that is not alive doesn't do anybody any good. But true faith in aspect, every aspect of your life, it's a blessing to many. Faith works, it finds a real use and a real purpose in the things that you do. And it begins to take a life of its own. You ever know somebody says, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm a believer and, 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 and living my life as, as a follower of Jesus Christ. What's well, my second nature? You, you ever heard of my second nature? Great, you're halfway there. Because as believers, the further we walk and follow through, and our faith is alive and active in our life, at some point it is no longer our second nature. It is our very nature. It is Him working in our lives for His good works and pleasure. It begins to take a life of its own. It becomes as natural as breathing. You don't even have to think about it. How many of you have to actually remind yourself to breathe? Anybody? You've got to remind yourself to breathe? Your faith in action should be like that. You shouldn't have to think about it. So if your faith is coming alive in the things that you do, it's true. And, and that kind of true faith is a clear indicator of what you really believe. What you do, what we do with our faith, our belief will be communicated louder than the words we speak. If our actions match our words, can you imagine how powerful that is? It's like this. If you squeeze a piece of fruit, right? You, in, we're gonna pe you squeeze a piece of fruit and you get orange juice. You can safely assume that that fruit is an orange. Okay, that's simple, guys. That wasn't a hard question, okay? Play along. If you squeeze an apple and get orange juice, is it an apple? No. Okay, so if you squeeze a fruit and orange juice comes out, that guarantees you got an orange, right? If you squeeze a Christian, what comes out? If the Holy Spirit comes out, that guarantees you got a Christian on your hands. If you squeeze a Christian and the devil comes out, hello. Simply put, What's on the end of the branch tells you what's flowing on the inside. If your, faith, if your faith indicates a true and active belief, it's true. And you notice that when he talks about this, about Abraham, that true faith produces and teaches more faith? See, Abraham took a very serious, very radical step of faith when he did what he was told to do to offer up Isaac to the point of raising his arm with a knife in his hand. He was exercising real faith. But can you imagine the faith that Abraham had when he walked home with Isaac? He had good faith going up to it. He had strong faith going up to it. He was ready to push a knife right through his son's heart and say, okay, God, you made a promise. I don't know how you're going to do it, but okay. But can you imagine the faith he had walking home? God, now I really know. Man. Faith begets work. The work begets more faith. You will find the more you exercise your faith and put it into action, the more your faith actually grows. The more you act on your faith, the more you learn that faith is real, that it can be trusted, and you're growing. So when your actions of faith are teaching you more faith, it's true faith. And true faith in action holds out hope. 
to both the one who has the faith and the one who benefits from the action of your faith. I've never spoken with anyone who has taken his or her faith and then acted on it. Ever, never have they come back and said, well, that was a waste of time. You know what I always hear when someone puts their faith into action? It doesn't matter what, it is, what the action is. But when they put that faith in action, you know what I always hear? That was so cool. Man, I was so blessed. That was awesome. If you put your faith into action, you'll find out that not only is the receiver blessed, but you're blessed as well. How many of you ever, ever, ever serve in anything? Maybe a mission trip or a WANA or what, you know, whatever. But here, I'll use a WANA as an example. This happens every year, no matter where I've been. In May, every Iwana worker says, I am done. <laughs> They're like, that's it. They are going to have, Kristen, you're on your own. Come August, <laughs> they're like, when does the want to start again? I miss my kids. Because they realized the blessing they had, and when they didn't have it, they're like, oh, I got to, I got to go do this again because the kids are blessed, I'm blessed, we're all blessed. Your faith in action blesses two people, and it blesses God. I have talked to numerous people who have done it, whether it was at the homeless shelter or, or a mission trip, a choir trip, or simply coming to the aid of a friend or neighbor. And every time they come back and tell me that, that they've exercised their faith, my word's not there, that they've done this thing, they've exercised that faith, they tell me every time how blessed and how fulfilled and how alive they felt how power it was like it was like electricity like man it was amazing and i'm like great go do it again so if our faith passes on hope into real life it is true true faith calls us to radical active Alive faith. I shared a story earlier. I'm going to share it with you now. Uh, faith in action and how it blesses and what it looks like. I have a friend, two friends, Doug and Karen. Doug and Karen, I used to, we would go on mission trips to Honduras, medical mission trips to Honduras, right? And they were great folks. Um, Doug was like 10 foot tall, and so I looked up to him. And Okay, if you're awake, say I am. Okay. And um, we, on, on like the third mission trip to Honduras, we get back home. We lived in Nashville. They lived in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And all of a sudden, I see where they have put their house on the market. So I touch base on them. Hey, Doug, Karen, where y'all moving to? Well, you know, we've been praying about it, and God has impressed upon our heart that we need to exercise our faith and follow him into the mission field, and so we're selling everything we own, and we're moving to Honduras. I said, that's wonderful. One problem, you don't speak Spanish. He said, we'll learn. They sold the house, the cars. They only left with two suitcases each and moved to Honduras. That was nine years ago. And if you talk to them today, they will tell you they are head over heels in love with what God has called them to do. All because they took their faith and belief and put it into action. They, they love the United States. They just won't come back. They bought property. They're building a house. You talk about somebody putting their money where their mouth is. How many of you would say, most likely, that my friend Doug and Karen believe and follow Jesus Christ? Do you believe it because they told you, or do you believe it because of what they did? All of our lives should look like that. All of us. Faith that is real. That faith has power. 
that faith will result in a changed life, in a changed behavior, and in our actions. Can people see, truly see, your faith? Because it will have a powerful impact when we put that faith into action. It's great, don't get me wrong. Tell people you believe. Tell them you're a disciple. Tell them you were a follower of Jesus Christ all day long. But let your actions back it up. In fact, it's great if you did the reverse. If you did the actions right, and they would kind of be like, why are you being so nice to me? Why are you helping me? Why do you seem not to get so upset? The last customer I had chewed me out because I was two cents short on the change. Why are, you, why, are you, why are you responding the way you do? Because I love Jesus. And I believe in him. Can you imagine how powerful that will be? You know what I guarantee they'll do? They'll listen to you. Now they'll listen to you. Can people see your faith? Is it a Rolex from China or is it a Rolex from Dubai? That's the challenge for all of us, to show the world. You ever notice Jesus said in Matthew, he said, like a city set on a hill, that you're a, that the shining light. Do you ever notice that light doesn't talk? Think about it. Does light speak? But you see it. You know what it is without saying a word. And Jesus says we're to be lights to a lost and dying world. Are we shining? Are our actions shining and showing the world that we truly believe? And I just believe that if we lived that way every day, the impact on our communities would be astronomical and amazing. I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me. In a moment, I'll pray. We'll sing. As we sing, maybe God is challenging you. Maybe it's to come to the altar and just say, you know what, Father? I, give me opportunities to put this into action. Give me opportunities to work out my faith with fear, working out my salvation with fear and trembling. Let me show the world who you've made me to be. Maybe there's something else you're struggling with, wrestling with. Maybe it's a praise. You want to come down to the altar. You want to pray. Just spend that time praying right here at the altar. Maybe you want to be a part of Salem and join this church. Be a part of this church family. We would encourage you. We'd love to have you. Or maybe your whole life you struggled with what faith really was. Believing that he is a son of God. Believing that he died and rose for your sins. So that he could have grace and mercy. Because he did those things. If you would just believe on him and follow. He said, I will forgive you. I'll show you grace and mercy. I will walk with you. I will show you how to exercise that faith. I will show you how to put it into real action. Actions that will glorify Him and show the world who you are. Whatever God has laid on your heart, I want to encourage you to come. Would you bow with me? Father God, thank you. Yes, hard lessons, hard challenges. <laughs> Thinking back to the mirror, what reflects back, we have to look at ourselves. Father, I pray for each one of us, all of us, that our actions and our words, our, our faith professed would be shown that we do possess it by our actions. That we show a lost and dying world that we believe, we truly believe and trust you. Well, the... <laughs> We thank you for this time to come and worship you. Pastor Doug has given us a challenge, a challenge that came from God, that we have faith, and we all have faith, and we thank you for that. But, Father, we need to go out into the world 
this week and show others by our actions and what we do that we truly do have that faith. So give us that opportunity, Father. Help us to show others that Jesus Christ loves us and that we love him and that he is truly the way, the truth, and the light, and no one comes to the Father except through him. We pray this in Christ's heavenly name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a